I called it. I called it. I, I, I called it. I don't know what else to say. I, I, I called it. Listen, I know in the last video, yes, Robin Songs goes on a 10 streak and pivots into the Zero Lux board. Yes, I'm aware that he was able to win streak, right? And a lot of people were annoyed. Not annoyed, but they were like, okay, sure. We know how to play the game from a win streak position, which I would actually argue most of you don't. But on top of that, somebody actually asked, okay, but what if you're not 10 streaking? What if you're low rolling and need to hit your units or you die, do you roll at 3-5? I feel like this video is useful only for 10% of your games where you are lucky and high rolling. First off, I would actually argue this Robin Song's game was actually not that uh, not that high roll. Um, and I would actually argue that this video probably applies to maybe closer to 20 to 30% of your games. Um, a lot of people struggle playing their strongest board in the early game, and that's a topic for a different video. We'll talk about, I'll probably make a video about early game and how to play your strongest board, because I would argue, like, most players, masters and below, don't know how to actually do that. Um, so we'll probably do a video on that in the future, but in today's video, I'm here to address this, because in today's video, we are going to be going over rank 1 Lilu, who is, if you don't know, the 2000 LP. 2000 LP. That is fucking incredible on the chinese server arguably one of the best if not the best server in the world um i mean na is the best server in the world obviously but you know i gotta hype up the other regions too you know what i mean you know what i mean you gotta gotta you know what i mean anyways in today's video we're gonna go over what was probably one of the worst starts i've ever seen in tft no good upgrades no upgrades period really Plus, really, really shit components. And how does rank one China deal with a situation of this sort? Well, let's go over it in today's video. Okay, so here we go. We are inside of Lilu's game. Now, this is Lilu. For those of you who don't know, he is rank one of China, who is currently sitting at 2000 LP. I believe he might be the first one to do it uh, on the set nine. But uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I only found out about him through Tanner, who on Twitter uh, posted this. I can't believe Lilu just hit 2k LP tonight. It's beyond unbelievable in such a short duration. And he posted the stream and VOD links. I will put these in the description below if you want to go watch them yourself. But really, really great stuff. Go follow Tanner on Twitter if you don't know him. Um, he posts a lot of stuff about League of Legends, specifically about the Chinese server. So it's always good to be going over to his stuff and just seeing like what's going on over on the Chinese side. Because, I mean, rank one's the best region. Uh, indisputable best region. But let's be honest, China... Very, very strong region. So we always want to know what's going on, especially if someone's able to hit 2k LP on the Chinese servers. So here, right off the bat, we are given a sort of a weird challenger stream start. It's kind of, I find it interesting that he does decide to hold on to the, the action here instead of just like putting on his bench to potentially sell for 10. But um, I mean, very interesting decision. Uh, I mean, I guess the idea is that like, even if he leaves it on his bench, it's very unlikely he can make 10 right off at 1-4. Uh, so maybe he just wants to play on his board. Doesn't really make a difference. But I mean, maybe it could have been an eco start. So I don't fully 100% agree with it, but it's fine. Anyways, moving on, going into the 2-1 augments, we're given Buried Treasure, Jewel Lotus, and Red Buff. Um, it's almost always re-roll the gray Jewel Lotus. Uh, it's just the interaction is very odd. I, I don't, I'm really not a big fan of your strongest interactions. For example, the Jewel Lotus, um, I know it's in Chinese, but, and I can't read Chinese, but off memory, it's, it's give, you give your strongest unit the ability to ch crit chance their spells, and it gives them 50% crit chance, right? Problem is, is that, like what your strongest unit is can get really confusing. Um, and it just doesn't feel very good to play, especially if you're like, hey, I took this augment, but I don't know what's going on with it. Like who has the buff? Usually it's pretty straightforward, but sometimes there's some weird interactions where like, for example, you can have Heimer Dirt accidentally become the strongest because it'll have three mods on it and maybe all your carries have two items. So it'll prioritize the Heimer Dirt. And then like, it's a, it's a very niche case scenario. We get the idea, like it, it can have some weird interactions. Personally, not a big fan of Jewel Lotus, so I would almost reroll the middle one. And Red Buff is okay. It used, this almost used to always be an auto pick augment uh, back when Poro was meta, but nowadays, uh, as we know, Ezreal is the meta. So Ezreal is probably going to be taken here. We roll Dead Eye, Heart, and Silver Spoon, so we're just giving this shit, right? Uh, for those of you who don't know, we are in Ionia. We are in the Dreaming Pool, so we are given a Warwick pair right off the bat. Good stuff. Interestingly enough, though, he does decide to level to four here, which is kind of odd because this definitely does not like align with how NA players usually play, especially near the top of the ladder, unless they're trying to win streak here. Um, I know the Chinese players and Chinese metas in general are very, very aggressive. So that might play a part into why he's leveling to four here. But in general, nowadays, a lot of NA players will stay level three at two one. And this is because we want to be trying to hit not only our pairs, but also just any tier one upgrades. You, you can find a lot of really decently strong units for tier uh stage two if you just stay level three and you just hold on to like every single one cost you see right so you're seeing units like aurelia two 
Jin 2. Cho'Gath 2 actually is pretty nice. Renekton 2 is actually amazing for stage 2 if you manage to get that Shurima start, which we saw earlier that he had, but he just didn't find a lot of the Renekton's here. Um, but again, one of those really, really strong boards that you can have that will preserve you a lot of HP throughout the stage 2. Uh, unfortunately though, our components are fucking dog shit. Uh, um, this is just a low roll component, so we're given double bow, crick glove, cloak, and belt. This is pretty, pretty poor. So we know for a fact we're going to be going for a loose streak here because nothing is really that slammable. Guard breaker, you could argue, is slammable, but you have to think about what's coming next, right? You're working with double bow and a cloak. Very hard components to kill, especially because Runance is not very meta right now. It's very difficult to make Runance work in a way that makes sense. So, unfortunately, Runance is not a slammable option here. Last Whisper is not really great. There's way too many ways to just incorporate shred onto your board so last whisper is not very great it's it's kind of only great on zeri uh maybe aphelios maybe not really though because you end up playing for Elliot, so i mean last whisper is kind of mid so anyways nothing to slam here you could argue against the guard breaker but again we do want to preserve our loose streak now what components what direction are we looking for this game because that's important to think about right because when you're whenever you're loose streaking whenever you are given a poor start this is a poor start no upgrades, no units, no bitches. Like, what are you going to do, right? We're going to lose streak. We're going to lose streak. We're going to try to preserve our streak. But even though we're loose streaking, we're going to try and consistently scout the lobby to try to find a way to make our board as strong as possible. That'll still make us lose the round so we don't lose too much HP. A lot of people, when they lose streak at the early game, they make this mistake of, like, they just open their board. And they just don't even bother preserving HP, and that's a really, really bad thing to do. Those extra bits of 2 HP, 4 HP, like here, he kills 1 unit here, that saves him 2 HP, right? That adds up. If you're able to kill 1 extra unit every single round and still 5 loss, you preserved 10 HP. That That's a lot to work with. So, again, that, that can cost you like a whole placement. So... Again, if you're loose streaking, make sure your board is weak, but not so weak that you're going to just completely, you know, just lose the game. Here he does see, though, he does scout one person who has both a Jace and an Aurelia, I believe, only on his board. So he is forced to open cell here, basically. So he's only left with just a Callista and a Aurelia here, right? But this is important, actually. Let's rewind it back. You might be going, like, who gives a fuck about him, like, opening his board, right? If you're in his position here, right, and you know you have to open your board if you want to guarantee your 5 streak... Who do you sell? This is actually really important here. Who do you sell in this scenario? You already saw the answer. You already know who he sells. But a lot of people would not sell the Warwick pair here. Makes sense. You don't sell Warwick pair because it's a pair. You might be able to hit Warwick 2 pretty soon. But here he actually opts to sell not only just the Warwick pair, but the Samira as well. Right? And now, again, it's because he wants to try and preserve his streak, but he sells all of it. Now, why is this the case? He does this because if you look on his components, he has both a Ginsu's Guard Breaker and also another bow available to him, right? It's very likely that he has to play around a Ginsu Slam coming up during Stage 3, and once Stage 3 hits, he knows he has to spike his board in a way that will make him stay alive, make him preserve HP, because you want to go and 3-streak from the spot. Here, really lucky close to 2-shot that he finds here um, with the double Callistas, but... It's a very difficult position to be in because, again, our components are looking so so shit, right? It's, it's looking very difficult to play around. We're sitting at 64 HP. Not a lot of HP to work with, but, I mean, at least it's something, right? It's better than sitting at, like, sub-60. There's one guy who's in the lobby with, like, 59, I think, or 63, rather. Uh, that is just terrible. Anyways, we're given our components here, and after we look at our next shop, let's talk about what, we, what the game plan is, right? So, right now, we're looking at all of our components here. We're trying to figure things out, and this is our shop given another Callista from the Dreaming Pool, and let's talk about it. So, we are we have two bows, a rod, a sword, a chain, cloak, belt, crick glove. We have basically every component in the game except for a tier. What do you make from this spot? We know stage 3, or realistically, from 3-2, we're going to have to start streaking, right? What do you slam in this scenario that will help you ensure a streak? Again, when it comes... From playing a losing position. From playing from a very, very poor opener, right? Or rather, just being dealt with no cards to work with, right? When you're given this type of situation, you need to think about, okay, I need to play for now. What is the strongest thing for me now? The strongest thing that we have right now going for us is the fact that we have a Callista 2. So we need to itemize this Callista 2 in a way that would make sense for us so that we are able to streak out. So in this position... What makes the most sense and what will streak us the hardest right now would probably be a Ginsu GS slam and then maybe either a Gargoyles or a Sunfire Cape to slam for our front line. Probably it's going to be the Gargoyles over the Sunfire. Now why is that the case? Gargoyles is because if you slam a Sunfire, you're left with Crick Glove and Cloak to kill 
for your components. That is a hard task to do. At least with belt belts, a bit more flexible because at the end of the day, you could always slam that guard breaker, but you could also probably greed out. I mean, you're sitting on two components. You don't have to slam, um, but you could probably greed out and try to play for like, I don't know, maybe like the JG for the Callista, which is a very, very key component for her to have. But also the belt could also just be something like a War Mogs, which has incredible synergy with a Goggle of Stone Plate. So as we can see here, we are thinking about a little bit about what to do. I believe um, a lot of players actually will also just try to streak this last stage here um just to really try to get that uh what you call it the bonus uh the bonus streak gold if you will because we're not rolling on three one we know that for a fact we're gonna roll that on three two so here as we can see we are slamming our items because we did want to scout the match just to make sure to see whether or not we would actually lose um or maybe even win but here we know that for if we slam that gargoyle plate with the belt on the set in the front line we probably still will lose so we're able to still preserve a lot of hp while preserving our lose streak good stuff 57 hp this is where the tides need to turn this is where we need to start spiking our board here we're given all natural social distancing and big is it big medium grab bag uh I mean, the, the Chinese character says big, so I don't know, maybe it's big. But anyways, out of these three options, it's probably almost always going to be the Ezreal Augment. Again, the Ezreal Augment, the Legend, is still very, very strong. You're given 12 gold, two components, and a Reforger. It's a lot of a lot of resources to work with. It, it almost doesn't feel like a gold augment. It, it feels really, really strong. Um, social distancing as well actually spikes your board quite a bit, so it's definitely a, a viable option from this spot, as well as all natural. But there is actually a correct answer from this spot if... Again, assuming, you know, before we reroll our augments, would you take social distancing from this spot? Like, if, if assume you had no rerolls here. Would you ever take social distancing from this spot over item grab bag? Would you ever do it? Because, again, the idea is that we want to start streaking, right? And actually, if you look at the stats, social distancing, uh, Masters Plus, is averaging a 4.34. Really, really, really strong augment here. And if we look at the grab bag here, um, big grab bag, 4.31. So actually, I already forgot the statistic for the other one. This is 4.31, this is 4.34. So it's like slightly worse. Slightly worse statistically, but it's 0 0.03. It's negligible. That could change tomorrow, right? So which one would you take from the spot? There, there, there seems to be a correct and incorrect answer from the spot, like I implied. Which one is it? Right? Think about it. I want you to think about it. Think about it. Do you have an answer? Because the answer is not social distancing. Now, why is that the case? The reason why, even though social distancing gives us a lot of combative power, and again, we're trying to spike our board here at 3-2, we need units to play. We don't have units to play at all. So actually, any gold augment here from this spot that'll let us spike our board with upgraded units is probably the way to go, especially because of the fact that this also gives us our components, like extra components to work with. This actually spikes our board quite a bit to the point where it's actually almost comparable to social distancing, especially because we only have one carry. Really, the only person that's really benefiting a lot from the AP and AD that got closer for this is just the Callista. So we're probably gonna reroll right side and middle. We actually are given Haunted Shell from this spot. Haunted Shell, um, from the data, looks like shit. It, it actually looks like shit. It's a 4.76, but I think this also contributes to the fact that people don't know how to play around uh, Shadow Isles. Uh, this augment... If you have the right condition set for it, and actually if we go into the Explorer here, uh, let's go over here to these, the Advanced one, Masters Plus, oops, GM Plus, Masters Plus, and we go to Shadow, what the fuck is this thing called? Haunted Shell. Haunted Shell, and then obviously it's the 4.74, but if we look at it with the right units, change the Delta up a little bit. Like you're seeing stuff like Shen 2, Yasuo 2, Gwen 2, you're looking at 4.2, 4.5, these are actually like really solid averages. Um, you just need to be able to find the right way to play around it. And again, like, just because the stats say that like, oh, this, this average is a 4.74, it's bad, you should never take it. That's not entirely true. If you know the correct setups for it, you can actually have pretty decent games. Again, 4.2, 4.2, 4.5 with the Gwen. This is most likely talking about um, a very simple, not simple, I would say, but uh, a very standard Shadow Isle board, which you're looking at something at like 4 Shadow Isle, which looks something like this. And again, this is a board that was sort of uh, prevalent during the PBE, but you don't see it very much anymore. It's a Yasuo Gwen duo carry board where you play something like this, where you're given the two Bastion front line, the Callista in the back line, Viego to help a little bit more fortify the front line, but not really. Uh, Gwen and Yasuo just go in and just clean up the stuff. This is a level seven board. Reroll at seven, you hit the Callista three. This is a potential line that he could play with Haunted Shell. It is a bit of a stretch to be taking it now because he has no Gwen items. Plus, it's un he doesn't really know for sure if he wants to commit to this Callista or not. He does have Ginsu G it's very possible for him to play into the Azir line. So this is, you know, it, it's a large commitment to be making, but it's definitely a viable option from this spot. I don't think you 
I don't think he has to sleep on this option, but the safer option for sure and the flex option for more opportunity is probably going to be item grab bag. So that's what we're going to take here with long. the Ezreal Augment on the left side. So that's what we end up taking. Love the six here. And then we start rolling down. We're trying to find our units. We find a Shen. We find a Sejuani. And again, when you are loose streaking, you want direction, but we also want to start playing around whatever we can find, whatever we can utilize, right? Here we find the Gwen. Here we find a potential, you know, Juggernaut, Sejuani. Um you know, Warwick 2, and this is, like, not the cleanest of pivots. This is a very not, like, that clean of a pivot. We are given the Hodge here as well, but it's actually not technically that slammable, because right now, we don't really have anybody who could, like, you could slam Hodge on this Kalissa here, but then now you're, like, kind of committing to the Azir line. Kalissa really, really, really needs JG. So here, after the roll down, he's like, okay, you know what? This is something really good. He, he goes, okay, you know what? That roll down was not great. That roll down was not great. A lot of people would just sit here and just bite the bullet because they want to rebuild their economy for 4-1 no matter what. That is not a good way to think about the game. Here in this spot, if he were to just sit on this board on the set one, the, the Warwick 2, um, if you ask me, he should have picked up the Frailier pair. In my opinion, he did roll over Lissandra and he was holding a Sejuani, but he just decides not to go for it. I guess his read is that it's not very good, but he decides to end up, you know, with this board. And it's like an Ionia board. Maybe he's trying to play into challengers from this spot. Maybe into the Callista with Ginsu GS. Maybe an IE. Maybe a GA for the Aswo. But right here from this spot, he's like, okay, if I sit on this board, not only am I not going to streak and win the stage, I'm going to actually keep losing a lot more HP. We're going to sit at 30. We're going to sit at 20 by 4 1. That is a problem. So he does the smart thing to do here, and he actually decides to keep rolling. A lot of players, myself included, probably would not roll in this spot. I probably myself would not have rolled in this spot ever. But he actually decides to do so because he knows that he needs to look for a bigger spike for his board. And that's what he ends up doing. He ends up fighting the four Shadow Isles, plus uh, set two for his front line, uh, Warwick two for his front line, slams the Redemption because he knows he needs to slam something here because he, again, he's trying to do his best to preserve his HP during stage three without having to roll down too much. Again, going down to about 20 here is pretty rough, economically speaking, but that's what he has to do. Because if he doesn't do that, he'll just lose the game because he just has no HP from stage three, right? Here we pick up the Gwen from the carousel, and yes, it does have a cloak. You're like, why would you want a cloak? Well, he's not picking up Gwen for the cloak, he's picking up Gwen for Gwen. So now he's sitting on a Gwen pair, and now he's basically sort of committing into the Shadow Isles line, because again, he has very, very little room to work with. It's going to be difficult for him to try and win out with this spot. He does slam the BT on Gwen. BT Gwen is actually kind of okay. It's not amazing by any means, but it's definitely a slam that you can utilize if you're sort of struggling and finding yourself in a position like he is, where he's like, hey, I, we're lacking in combat. We need power. We need to slam. We need to do something now. So BT on Gwen, again, it's not bad at all. It's actually like kind of okay. Uh, it's, it is acceptable at the very least. Um, but here, unfortunately, we do lose and we're not able to streak here, which is really, really sus. It sucks, but that's just how it is. Looking at our board though, again, we're, this is a fine stage three board. We are mixed streaking. It is a little bit difficult, but hey, that it, you're not going to be able to just five streak after losing all of stage three too. Your odds are higher because you're able to make that economic advantage for yourself by loose streaking all of stage two, but don't expect to always win streak completely during stage three. It's very, very unlikely, especially because you can't roll down and zero out at, at level six. Like it makes no sense. It, you would just, you would just lose. Four one hits, everyone goes level seven and you have no money to work with. That's just not very good. So here, 39 gold. He actually doesn't sell the Zed here to make 40, which is really, really interesting in my opinion. But his idea, again, is probably to commit into this Callista Gwen line. And you might be going, Callista Gwen, there's no way this line is any good. And on average, it's not. I'm going to be honest, on average, it's not. But we have to think about ways to play around what we are given now, because if we don't, we're going to be super, super fucked. You might have noticed he also tailored his board to make sure that he hits the Shadow Isles so that he gets the God Willow's, uh, what is it, the, the portal or whatever, and he's able to play into the Gwen here, the Gwen 2. He puts into the Ionia line. This is basically the board that I showed you earlier with the Ionia challenges with Yasuo, but instead it's actually just the, the whatchamacallit, the Aurelia over the Yasuo, and it is the Zed over the Karma, which I actually, in this spot, he actually prefers Zed here because it gives Slayer for Gwen. Good stuff. That is something that you can do as well. Um, I don't play this line personally myself very often, so it's just if you see my if you see me playing four shadow isle on stream, I'm panicking like all the time. It, it, it's 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 a bad time. So, anyways, moving on, going into the four two augments, we are given shadow isle crown, uh, lucky gloves, and the fucking the third Ezreal one. The third Ezreal one on the left side here, it's always not that great. Um, it's actually I take it so little that I actually forget the name of it. I think it's well earned comforts. Um, 
It's all right, but I would not recommend taking it in this spot, especially if you're given Shadow Isle Crown. Again, whenever you see that you're given a crown, you can think of that as sort of a potential fawn. Because now he can drop the Viego from this spot and pick up the Shadow Isle Crown, Shadow Isle the Shen, and then play another unit so that you can flex in more options and more stronger quality units. So Shadow Isle Crown definitely is something that he could take here from this spot. Uh, definitely want to reroll middle and left here just to see what we're given. And we are given the Shadow Isle Crown. Unfortunately, we are given a Shiv, which is really, really awkward. But we do have to roll down here, try to find whatever units we can find. Hit the Shen too, very lucky. Hit the Viego too, which is nice. Find a Aatrox, which is like, okay, maybe we can play this, maybe we can't. Again, it is for... Um, for that Juggernaut, for that Slayer. Or not the Juggernaut, but for the Slayer. You know what it is. And then um, Shadow Isle the Shen here, which is really great. Shadow Isle Emblem. I learned this the hard way yesterday. Uh, really great on tanks. Here, makes a very interesting decision here to slam the Shiv onto the Gwen. That is interesting. Um, at this point, I think he realizes that he is 29 HP. And he needs to slam something now. And he has to slam it onto the Gwen here. Uh, really lucky find to find the Yasuo 2 here. Um, but he's playing a completely uncontested line, uh, except for the Yasuos, he's definitely getting contested for Yasuos, but he does get a, a little bit fortunate here, finding the Yasuos in the Shen 2 here, and he's able to sort of stabilize here with Gwen 2 and the Shen 2 Yasuo 2 board, and life is good, life is good, he's literally playing just whatever he hits, you might be going, oh, he hiled out of his mind, but at the end of the day, he's playing what he hit, if he hit a Sejuani 2, he's probably playing around that Sejuani 2, um, but he found the Shen 2, so it is what it is. Uh, but again, playing around whatever you hit, playing around whatever four costs you find, and then just try to figure it out. Again, it does help a lot that he's trying to play a uncontested line. If you play lines that are congested and contested, you are not going to find your two-star four costs as early as he is here, because again, it, it's hard to find these units. Like sure, Shen and Yasuo are both in the Ionian line, but he does get a bit fortunate here, but it's very possible he could have hit something like Lissandra to Sejuani 2, and that's what he has to flex into. Like again, he's playing around whatever he hits here, and he's just hoping for the best. Here he does, again, take another loss is looking at a 17 right now he's playing for a top six but notice how he's not like rolling down anymore after at 4-2 or whatever it was maybe even at 4-3 after he hit the yasuo 2 and everything he has just been sitting still what is the plan what is the plan we know because of dreaming pool we're given senna for our next in and we're sitting on uh free duplicated from raptors which is really nice and we're sitting on a lot of closes we've been holding every single one we found so the idea is simple we want to econ as much as we can until we're one life. And then that's what we did. We lost one. Post neutrals. Great. Use all that money. Send it down. For the Callista Gwen line, you need Callista 3. This is like crucial for this comp to work at all. Because Callista 2 is okay, but she can only do and pump so much damage that... Excuse me. Sorry, I had a Dunkin' Coffee and that shit makes me gassy. But... <laughs> Ah, uh, that's not TMI. Fuck you. Uh, but like, listen, Callista 3 is like necessary for this comp. Without it, you basically are primary carry Gwen. Good fucking luck. And again, remember, our Gwen has this going on right now. BT Shift with what? A JG. Like, this is not good itemization. Ideally, you want something like this with something like the Ionic Spark. Like, let me just show you how far removed this is, actually. This is actually incredibly wiss. Um, instead of a BT, you want Gunblade. Right? Instead of JG, you want Archangels. And instead of Shiv, you probably want the Ionic Spark. Right? This is way better than whatever the fuck is going on here. This is like the B tier version of a Gwen build, right? So you really need this close to three to pop off, or maybe even find Yasuo items, but this is incredibly unlikely. So we're just gonna be trying to play around the Callista, I, Callista 3 here, because that, that's our win con. If we don't hit, it's GG go next. We tried our best. It's a top six, right? Maybe a top seven even, or maybe it might even be an eighth. Um, but that's just how TFT is sometimes. You really got to play around your win conditions, right? You really got to play around these conditions. Hope that you hit this condition, especially if you're in very desperate situations like this one. Here, again, we know we're playing in Dreaming Pool, so we know we're getting that Senna. So six Shadow Isles we know is already on the table. So actually, the perfect scenario is that we're able to hit this close to three as soon as possible. Maybe because we don't have, hopefully don't have to roll that much, we're able to tech in the Gwen eventually. And then with the Shadow Isle Crown, which if I can find it right here, puts us at six level eight. This is the ideal scenario. This is what we want to hit. And if we can hit this board, we'll be in a much better spot, right? We know, Lilu knows, 2KLP, Chinese, just fucking, I was going to say Grandmaster, but he's not even a Grandmaster. Grandmaster is the highest level of chess, but it's not for TFT. But just absolute mastermind knows his win condition and plays around it. So here, as we can see, he is going to start rolling down. I, I apologize for the little UI, the, the play bar there being in the middle. Here, hits the Callista 3, 
and sells the Aatrox pairs, by the way, because he knows he has to play this board now, because if he doesn't, he will start to bleed out. He needs to hit everything and play everything now. Selling the Aatrox is really, really sucks, especially because it was an Aatrox pair, and it gives it's the best Slayer that he could ask for, but this is what this is what he has to play around. This is what he has to hope for, and pray to God that this board is enough to streak him and secure him at the very, le at the very least a top four. That is the plan and here he's very fortunate to hit the six shadow isles hit everything here and again these gwen items whist as fuck he does have a hodge on the asphalt which i guess is okay um i would make the argument that he should bow the sun here because um you really just want every little bit and ounce of power into your board that is 10 percent attack speed that could be the difference between one cast and not casting so definitely think that this bow on senna is vital but here really great positioning spots the zephyr switches positions last second and even switches the gwen onto the same side as the Callista. Really, really smart positioning stuff here. Why is that good? It's because you want your shred and you want your main carry to be on the same side. If you're ever playing something like a Darius reroll, for example, you want your uh, your Samira, you want your Samira, the one cost unit, to be right behind the Darius. Not not right behind, right behind, like not to dick up the butt distance, but like you know, like give a little bit of space, a little bit of breathing room, right? And then that way, whenever Samira sunders the the opponent that tar that uh, the Darius is targeting. Darius will just fucking wipe them with the ultimate, and you're playing a very fun, very easy to play Noxus board, right? Clear fundamentals, really great stuff. Here, unfortunately, he gets absolutely cassanted here. Um, that sucks. And now we're sitting at 2 HP. Uh, again, you might be going like, damn, this game kind of sucks, but at the same time, it's like, dude, this guy played this game beautifully. He played to, to the best of his ability as much, min-maxing as much as possible, and praying that it works out here he's gonna take the tier uh he's gonna take the hodge here i actually would have taken last whisper from the spot because you are getting enough omnivamp already on the asphalt with the ionia bonus plus the uh hand of justice so with another hodge here that's a lot of fucking hodges i mean sure i guess it's fine i think last whisper is a little better i think yes will pump a little more damage if he's able to shred for himself but maybe double hodge is just better i don't fucking know but that's where we're sitting at right here we're playing into a tristana board with bastion's morning light that is some scary ass shit especially because this guy has a Cassante and a poppy three but as we can see here six shadow isles is doing the work which by the way six shadow isles um is surprisingly very tanky like you you're seeing these shields during the fights they are massive massive shields that we are getting here and notice the fucking discipline the discipline of this man He's sitting at 34 gold, he's 2 HP, and he's sitting. Why is he sitting? He's sitting because he knows there's nothing better that he can throw onto his board. And if he were to roll and donkey roll for a potential maybe Senna 2, it is so, so unlikely. He might as well just save up and try to go level 9. That is some balls of steel. If it's me in this spot, I am donkey rolling every fucking round. Praying I hit that Senna too. Even though I know for a fact that on 6-1, I'm going to hit another Senna from the Dreaming Pool. I don't give a fuck. I am praying to God that I'm hitting the Senna too. Here, as we can see on the right side here, 9 HP, 7 HP, 2 HP, 1 HP, 1 HP, 1 HP. Close fucking lobby. This lobby is anybody's game. It is, it could be, like, this could go anyway. We have no idea. Here, he actually ends up selling the rise that he had on his bench here. Hopefully, uh, probably picks up the GA here for Yasuo. That is what I would take here. But, um, here, he, I think he has barely enough to go level 9. I might be wrong here. But if he goes level 9, he can tech in this extra Senate here and then just call it a day. He has exactly 70 gold. So, I believe he could pump level here and then just put in the extra Senate and pray to God. Play up a pawn. Hope to God that's good. Here, Unfortunately, plays into the Cassante with two... By the way, this is Cassante 2 with Sunfire, Gargoyle, Blue Buff. This is a fucking menace. But luckily enough, the Calista is actually able to find all her spears onto the Cassante and is able to clear him out, the biggest threat of this lobby. And he's able to secure not only a top 4, but actually a top 3. Absolutely critical, absolutely insane. So here, he's able to actually pump level 9. He actually saves his Econ for one extra round, which is fucking nuts. That is some balls of steel. I would not have done that either. This is absolutely insane. Text in the Karma here as well for not only the Ionia bonus to get... Or I guess he texts in a double sana. But um, he could have texted in the Karma for the extra uh, invokers. But unfortunately, it seems as though that the double sana is just better and stronger from his read. And it looks like that he doesn't value invoker that much. Here, this, I mean, obviously, Senna 2, Senna 2. Or like a pair of Senna's is a pair of Senna's. Gets the kill here. It's a top 2. And actually, the other guy loses to his ghost. And it's a first. There is obviously a bit of luck that went into this game in terms of the matchmaking and a bit of the fight RNG. But nonetheless, this was not even possible had he not min-maxed 
every single ounce, squeezing water out of stone to try to get to this point. I hope you guys learned something. Take care. Happy climbing.